So I'm going to talk about distance from perfect today. This is a talk I've given a few times at conferences and stuff. And it's the way when I talk to clients that I try to get them to understand why we would do something. So, you know, they'll look at something and say, well, why should I do this? You know, what's the, what will happen? You know, will this improve the rankings and, or, or help me in social media or whatever else? And what I'm always trying to say, this thing just died. Come on. Oh, man. Oh, well. Oh, unless my computer just. There we go. This doesn't usually happen at conferences. This is not part of the presentation. Um, so I kind of dial it back a few steps to how people make consumer decisions. And you don't have to read this book, because I did, and it's painful. Um, it's really interesting, but it's excruciating. It's really good table, uh, bedside table reading if you want to fall asleep in a heartbeat. Um, however, it brings up this idea of quality and value. And it really comes down to quality. This is the thing that drives consumer decision making. And it's quality of experience as well as quality of product. So right before you buy a product, before you have it in your hands, there are other cues that tell you, I want this or I don't want this. And perfect means 100% quality, right? I mean, that's what it really means. Uh, so if you can be perfect in experience and perfect in product and perfect in everything that happens in the whole experience, start to finish, that's when you know you're going to kick the crap out of all of your competition. And an example is, so I, I bought this fancy car. This was my midlife crisis car, all right? I'm done with the lease in another eight months and I'll get something more reasonable again. Um, and I love this car. It's very fun. It's great to drive, everything else. But it's a GM. So after a couple years, it's still running perfectly, it still drives perfectly, but it has a squeak in the dashboard. And if you know me and my personality, it might as well be someone sitting behind me going <laughs> down a chalkboard. It is painful. All right, and I've gone back to the dealer, and I've shown it to them, and I've done it, and of course it never does it for them. They kept it for a couple of days and said, oh yeah, we found it, they fixed it. Two new squeaks. All right, so I gave up, I've stopped going, because every time I go, they make more squeaks. But that is an experience that I will remember, and next time I am car shopping, I will probably not buy a GM, because I know, awesome car to drive, but unless I'm just gonna lease it for a year, probably not worth it, and I'm not gonna lease a car for a year, so end of that. Um, things like this, also like fingernails down a chalkboard, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Bernie's just like, oh God! Um, so why do these things hit us? Well, there's this algorithm we have Okay, and this is encoded into us from when we were swinging from trees, running from saber-toothed tigers, whatever else. And we have two things that get our attention, all right? Perfection, which can be something really beautiful, something just in some way amazing um, to us, and total imperfection. <laughs> See that reaction? Okay, this is, a, this is a naked mole rat. It is supposed to look like this, all right? And to it, to it, of course, it's beautiful. Um, but you're going to remember this slide forever, right? So we are, our whole algorithm, our entire, the makeup of our brains are meant to detect per, the level of perfection of something. That's it, right? In some situations, perfectly imperfect means I'm going to be eaten now. I should not stay here. Perfection means I am perfectly safe. I have food. I have family. I have I have reproduced, I am good, I have fulfilled my basic role, I have achieved as close to perfection as I can. Um, our algorithm is meant to seek perfect, so are the algorithms, therefore, of search engines and social media outlets, conversion rate optimization. Everything we do in marketing is an attempt to cater to that algorithm. All right, that's the best way to look at it. Uh, it's not to cater to Google, it's not to cater to Bing, it's not to cater to Facebook, it's to cater to whatever it is that drives the thinking behind those things. And all of those things are trying to deliver the perfect experience. And this isn't like, you know, this can become a hand wavy thing where you're saying, you know, oh, write great content and Google will rank you higher, which is complete and utter bullshit. So you have to figure out which forms of perfect they are most interested in. This is what happens when you ignore perfect and you're attempting to, 
to achieve perfect for the search engine instead of yourself, all right, instead of your, for humans. This is content that was written by some kind of Markov chaining algorithm, and it grabs content from all over, rewrites it automatically, and then spews it all over the internet in an attempt to build links and get higher rankings. And this worked for about four years. And clients, of course, and, and not, you know what, not clients. A lot of SEOs are still coming in and saying, this is what we should do. This is called content spinning. In the good old days, we did it too, because it was so great. It was so easy. <laughs> um, but it doesn't work anymore, all right? This is a great one, I love this. <laughs> um, so Target, Target and eBay, Target and eBay bid on everything, all right? So it used to be that if you typed in atomic bomb or wife or, you know, whatever, it would say buy atomic bomb, buy wife at Target, buy wife online. This is an example of trying to, to cater to perfect without really thinking about it. Again, you find out that there's this keyword matching algorithm in Google AdWords and you say, oh, okay, I'm going to use that. And you completely forget about the fact that you're catering to human beings. This is imperfect. I will remember this ad for the rest of my life. All right. Most people won't. Most people aren't marketers. But this does impact my, my perception of them. And I have actually ever since persisted in making fun of every marketing thing that Target tries to do um, because sometimes they really blow it. Um, stuff like this. So you know, this is someone trying to cater to the fact that for a while, Google would actually really support imperfection. I don't know if you've heard of this guy, but he stole from people, he was nasty to them, the customer service was deliberately awful because he knew that he would get lots of negative reviews, which helped him rank higher on Google. Now as soon as Google found out, they turned that off, right? Which brings me to my other point about this. If you do stuff that's like this and thereby achieve some higher ranking, because remember, we're encoded for imperfection and perfection, not just perfection. If we, you do something like that deliberately, it's not future-proof. Someone's going to figure it out, right? Some algorithmic thing or society in general or whatever, they're going to look and they're going to say, oh, okay, I get it. We cannot, you know, we're going to turn this off. At which point he went out of business and actually is in jail now. Um, but, you know, you're at least going to go out of business. This is why a lot of sites and companies got hit by Google penalties, all right? And why none of our clients ever got hit by Google penalties. We did, which is a whole other story that I can tell sometime. Um, but none of our clients did, all right? Because we have never catered to this idea of trying to attempt perfect for the search engine. We're trying to attempt perfect for the audience, okay? Social media, same thing. You can get all tricky and fancy, or you can just cater to certain basic stuff that works really well. Site design, right? Justify it in terms of a great experience. Not in terms of, ooh, look at what we can do now. Just great experience. Um, and actually, one quick philosophical note. This has happened in marketing and communications for hundreds, if not thousands of years, right? There's always the scare tactics. There's the Donald Trumps and whoever else who are trying to set themselves apart by being extreme and saying things that are ridiculous. And they probably know it, maybe they don't, but eventually people catch on and it all goes to shit for them. Sometimes it takes a long time but it does happen. So this is future-proof stuff throughout. So when you look at things like politics and you say, oh my God, people are stupid, how are they? It's, that's not it, all right? It's that we all have the same basic perfection detector, but it does take time for it to kick in. Google didn't figure out link spam and content spam for five, six, 10 years. They just, all I'm saying is it's not future-proof. So organic search does it, but I don't want you to think it's just organic search. Um, paid search, you know, they have quality score, which can have a profound impact on the cost of your bid. If you have a one quality score in Google AdWords, and this is how Google looks, they look at click-through, they look at the quality of the landing page for a particular paid ad, whatever else, um, you can increase your bid by a factor of six if you have a low quality. If you have very high quality, you can discount by 30%. Facebook has their own ranking algorithm. All right? They don't reveal it much and you know everybody says, "Oh, they're charging for they're charging business pages now." And they are charging business pages now, but that's because 
They should. They need advertising. But even the advertising performs better, and they will deliver it to more people, if it appears to be getting more attention. So something in your feed that gets tons of attention will likely get redistributed to more people. On Twitter, that algorithm is actually still completely organic, right? If I see something cool, I'm going to rebroadcast it. It's going to multiply there. But in social, this is really important. And obviously, in conversion rate optimization and everything else. So distance from perfect is not just a search thing, all right? It is everything you do in marketing. And the rule is, the question you should always ask yourself and ask the client is, all other things being equal, will this change tactic or strategy move me closer to perfect than my competitors? That's it. This is the universal question. Okay? If you can answer this yes or no, that's the first gating question. If the answer is no, not, probably not worth doing it. If the answer is yes, then you're going to take it to the next step. So all other things being equal means you and your competitors are on exactly equal footing except this one tactic or strategy. Your site is slower than theirs. Everything else is equal. Will making your site faster move you closer to perfect? Yes. Your site and their site are on exactly equal footing. Having a purple people leader flying across the screen randomly when you sell rubber grommets will not move you closer to perfect. And closer to perfect means, again, catering to that human algorithm of what perfection is. And what you do once you know that is you balance breadth, depth, and difficulty, right? So, and this is just prioritizing. And, and we all here understand that. The people I presented to might not have, so I put this in here. But it's this idea that you know, it's going to have broad impact across many channels, it's going to have deep impact, and it's easy to do. So ideally, it's 100% of channels, 100% impact, really easy. The least ideal would be something that has only impact on one channel, shallow impact, and is really hard to do. So if you're prioritizing, that's how you do it. <clears throat> and we do it using, anybody? Marketing the marketing stack. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if you think about it, a high distance from perfect in infrastructure impacts all the other channels. A high distance from perfect in content impacts all the other channels. <clears throat> Things you do here and here will improve performance there. All right? So for example, if you have crappy writing throughout your site, Google can figure that out and shove you down in the rankings. If you have broken links all over your site, same thing. If you have crappy content on your site and people click on a social post and bounce right back and don't share it, it's going to hurt you in social media. So these are things you always think about. Our job at Portent, our job is to always communicate risks and benefits of a higher or lower distance from perfect across the entire marketing stack. Just memorize that. If you always do this, if every single day you look and this is what you're doing for clients and then you're recommending solutions and prioritizing, you're doing your job. And anytime you get away from this, it may be fine, but chances are there's something going on. There's a client who's really you know, zeroed in on one tactic or you're not using the right data points or whatever else. So some examples. Um, Debris is one of my favorite examples, and this goes across all the different channels. So starting with the easiest one, broken links. Um, all other things being equal, will fixing broken links on my site move me closer to perfect than my competitors? Yes, absolutely. Right? No brainer. Usually pretty easy to do. Broad impact across SEO, user experience, paid search, social, everything you can think of. Fixing broken links is going to improve it. Now bad is when you have a broken link on your site, right? Between two pages on your site. And you can detect those using a tool like Screaming Frog or our crawler. All right, they'll go through the site and they'll find them. What's really bad is broken links from another site. So there's a link on another site pointing to yours saying, you know, for more information, click here. They click it and they get a 404. They don't see anything. That is the worst possible problem you can have with debris because it impacts the entire stack. All right, it impacts. It's an infrastructure problem that impacts content because they're not seeing it. It impacts social because they're not going to share it. It impacts paid, if you ever created any paid media anywhere that points at it. And it impacts all of earned, right? Organic search, everything else. So ways you can find broken incoming links. You can use Bing Webmaster Tools. I'm not going to go deep into this because 
people here understand this, but these are just things that are possible. So you understand this is doable if clients say that there's, you know, there's things they can't do. If they have Bing Webmaster Tools set up, you can just go in and you can find all the broken links and then you can figure out where those links come from. Google Webmaster Tools, same thing. You can pull up the links and then you can see where those links are, are coming from. Notice many, many different outside sites, right? External links. If we can fix that, we're going to do the easiest link building ever, right? Because we're just going to get those links back. You can also get the log files from the clients and sweep those. That is the best way to do this. All right, I am always asking clients, can I get a look at your raw log files, your raw, log, raw web server log files? If you can't, all right, go back to using these other options, but if you can, it's really good. I have some little scripts I wrote for folks who want to geek out about this that will go through and find all the broken links from Google and not from Google, you know, detected by Google and not detected by Google. So you can just fix those links. Again, easiest link building ever. Easiest upgrade you can ever make. Social media posts. Um, will improving this post move me closer to perfect than my competitors? Again, all things being equal, yes. This is a really easy one, right? You don't have to modify the site. You don't have to do anything except maybe improve an image. Like here. This is about Hillary Clinton's stance on drug and alcohol addiction, but notice the image has nothing to do with that, right? The key content here is up here. It should be right there, okay? So easy upgrade. This one, this is for Wix, the, the website design tool and hosting. Um, to me, first glance, this was an ad for a flower website. I mean, seriously, until you read the text, you know, what's your first impression? My first impression was, oh yeah, clearly this is, you know, I don't know what it is, but it's not a website design tool. Um, paid media, you know, will target, will better targeting my audience move me closer to perfect than my competitors? So here's a good one. I did a search for Dungeons and Dragons terrain, which is like the fake little mountains when you have your little men running around on the tabletop. Um, yeah, I know. I still do this. I still do this. But notice GMC has their all-terrain vehicle there. Now, first of all, I can tell you, this audience does not drive GMC all-wheel drive, okay? They don't. <clears throat> I'm considered a high-functioning gamer, so I have my Cadillac. Most are going to be driving like Pintos that barely work. Um, terrible paid media, all right? This is ruining the user experience, ruining it, all right? This is going to affect everything because on Google, uh, organic, they now measure this thing called pogo sticking. So if I click on a, a ranking, go to this page, and then go right back to Google, they're tracking that as an indicator of a site's relevance or not relevance or distance from perfect. That will in some way push you down in the rankings. Um, I'm actually testing this right now in a reputation management project for a client, and it appears to work. So. A little frightening, but it does. It's going to affect paid because you're going to make less money because this ad won't show up once, but then I'm never coming back to this website. It impacts social because there's actually people out there complaining about this. Seriously, there's people who have nothing better to do, so they go out and they say, hey, look at the stupid pop-up on Entrepreneur. I actually did that, which is why I'm saying this. Um, <laughs> but so you get the idea. Um, general user experience. Will speeding up my website move me closer to perfect than my competitors? This is a long-standing pet peeve for me. This was someone who did not hire us, so I will continuously mock them. Um, they had a, in their footer, they had one of those tacky, you know, like 2001 um, shaded tiles. It's literally that wide. It was 77 kilobytes. Everybody here probably understands how completely ridiculous that is, all right? 77 kilobytes. A full, like, photograph might be 77 kilobytes. A little teeny stripe like that? No, I compressed it to two kilobytes. No difference in appearance. Our buddy here, Molly, um, the original image, 700 kilobytes. Uh, the second image, 64 kilobytes. No perceived loss in quality, nothing. And just think about it. That's cutting load time by a factor of 10. We have clients who have every single image on their page. I just helped a client with this. They had um, four megabytes of images, four images on their blog post. 
So quick compression went from four megabytes to about 400 kilobytes, much better. Come on, he's awesome. By the way, Pacific Science Center has an entire live exhibit of them tunneling around. If you have kids, they will trip out on it. They will trip out on it. <laughs> Did someone say why? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I kind of like it now. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, see, just watch the pic. Just watch it at Pacific Science Center because they're like climbing over each other, and it's just it's awesome. They can chew through. Well, just to have nightmares now, they can chew through concrete. So if you ever hear scratching at your house, it could be a naked mole rat coming for you. No, no. Actually, they require like 90 to 110 degree temperatures. So Seattle, very safe from naked mole rats. Yes, they go backwards and forwards at the same speed. So if trapped in a tunnel, if you're trapped in a tunnel with a swarm of naked mole rats coming after you, you're screwed. Although I'm wondering, who will win? One naked mole rat or a dachshund? I vote for dachshund. The dachshund, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, this doesn't even have to be an image anymore. Okay, this was, this was, three years ago with a client who barely, obviously, could grasp compression. Um, didn't hire us because we were too expensive. Go figure. Uh, you can use a simple tool like Google PageSpeed Insights. If you just do a search on Google for Google PageSpeed, there's this cool form. You type in an address, and it gives you a list of things to fix. Some of these things are easier than others. Image compression is definitely easy. Google PageSpeed will give you a list of images and the compressed versions. You don't have to do anything. You download the images, you upload them to your server. Don't be surprised or frustrated when it takes the client two or three weeks to do this. It's because they are taking the images, giving them to a designer who is then saying, I don't want to do it because it can reduce their quality. Then eventually the quality, they realize it's not going to get worse. Then they have to give it to the development team, which says they're going to charge them $10,000 to upload the images. Then we have to come back and tell them it shouldn't cost $10,000. Then Blake shows them two lines of code that will do everything for them. Then we upload it and we're all good. This is a recent experience, um, but anyway. Uh, you can use these things called uh, network or waterfall diagrams. And this is for the, the nerdier among us, but this will give us a lot of really good data on server issues that are slowing sites down um, as well, and also rendering issues. So if you have crappy code on a site, maybe everything's transferring really fast, but then it just your browser just sits there trying to figure out how to render the page. That's perceived load time. And in case you want evidence, there's revenue. This is a research that Michael did. Um, you know, just look at page load times and page value, meaning how many how many dollars each page generates. I'm sorry if you guys can't see this because of the camera. We're still working on some of that, um, but you can kind of see what happens as a page gets faster. And there is no reason that any web page on any website should take more than one and a half to two seconds to load. I have never seen a page where that's justified, including fashion websites. Um, user experience, still going. All other things being equal, will helping my users out move me closer to perfect? Here's a really easy one. I don't know if anyone tried to buy BB-8 today. Um, it's a little droid from uh, the new Star Wars. Um, I don't understand it, by the way. As a, functioning, as a functional shape, I don't get it. You know, R2 makes more sense to me, but maybe it's just because I'm old. Um, I just don't see how that thing gets around. Uh, but Yes, I know. They built a real one to prove it. I just think it'd be easier. Maybe there's no economic, there's no economy in the Star Wars universe. That would explain a lot, um, like carrying little fusion reactors around in your swords. Um, but see, I'm nerding out again. Uh, you go to this site, and this is Spiro, and it just says the product is unavailable. It doesn't say what you can do. It doesn't give you any options. For example, Best Buy still has them, and Spiro will still make money if they sell them through Best Buy. Uh, you can now buy them for like $7,000 on eBay. I wouldn't link there. Yeah, people bought them up and then they're reselling them on eBay. Um, yeah, 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 that's a, good, a soccer ball on a, next party, it's a soccer ball on a Roomba. I love it, that's awesome. Um, and then with like a bowl on top. Um, you know, this is a real, yes, this is really, <laughs> Wilson, um, this is a really easy thing to deal with, okay? What do you have to do? Add two lines of text. 
So almost zero degree of difficulty. Depth, huge depth because it'll sell more product. Goes across almost every channel. Again, pogo sticking for organic search. Bad experience for paid search, right? So pogo sticking for paid search. In social, there are already people complaining. And there's much nastier notes than that now. <laughs> um, but people are already complaining in social media. Content. I could go on about this one for even longer. Um, first of all, everything is content. All right. As soon as you say content to someone, you know, to anyone involved in web marketing except us, they think blog post, blog post, blog post, blog post. Okay, utter crap. Blog posts are one kind of content. Product images are another. Product descriptions are another. The content on your homepage is another. Interactive tools are another. All right. It's all content. So all other things being equal, well, having content that is not shit move me closer to perfect than my competitors. For example, and I actually have no interest in buying this thing. It was just a really good example today. Um, I got this in my email. That's pretty much how it looked in my email. All right? I can't read that. Autonomous behavior? I mean, it looked like anonymous behavior when I first looked at it. I, you can't read this. And if you see it in my email, it's even worse. Um, I can see this. I see new, and then the smallest thing there that I can read is the product. And then their clever note, this is the droid you're looking for, you know, wouldn't have thought of that one, um, is way down the page. Okay? This is bad content. All right? This is an email. It's terrible content. This is better. All right? And I am a Museum of Modern Art snob, I admit. But look at it, right? What's the biggest thing there? The offer. After that, there is more detail, but I can read it. Logo at the top, I immediately understand what it is. This is terrible content. All right? This is an article on HowStuffWorks.com. It's tough getting noticed on the web. A web page can provide useful information, or not, about a particular subject in an interactive and engrossing way, yet still attract few visitors. What is that? Who cares? Right? That is completely pointless. You can go down three paragraphs before there's anything the least bit useful on this page. I don't know if they have a word counting requirement on this site or what. There is no point in this. This is terrible content. I'm sorry if someone here wrote this. I totally apologize. But um, this is Moz's guide, and it's much better. It just starts. It says, you know, how search engines operate. They have two functions, crawling and indexing. Boom. I could actually stop right there and I have a pretty decent understanding. I have, now under, I have now learned 10 times more than I learned on this page. That's for sure. Um, slide presentations, OK? Bullets are bad. Bullets are just bad. I've never seen anything that has to be in bullets. All right? Executives love to do slides that have millions of bullets. They are doing that so that people can read the slides later, write something for them to read later. For the slides, don't make people do this. All right? And that's what I want to do whenever I see slides like that. Um, use images. right? This communicates something. This communicates more. I'm going to use that again and again. In fact, I'm just going to start posting it randomly to HipChat. Um, I'll see if I can find some animations, some GIF animations, too. Can you come up with a name before um, I thought Harold. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Sweet. Awesome. Just do copy bar after that. Because uh, copy bar are still my favorite animal. Um, all right, obfuscation. This is one where I completely go off on clients and they don't always understand why. Um, all things being equal, will delivering content using JavaScript or some other weird technology be, move me closer to perfect than my competitors? This is an example where you're doing something just because you can do it and not because it's going to move you closer to perfect. So I'm going to use SEO as the example here. This screws up everything. It slows up page rendering time on mobile devices. It's a freaking nightmare. Um, in social media, it can actually mess up the way, it, uh, the way something like Facebook shows the blurb and the image from a site. So here's weather.com. All right, They are the dominant force in online weather. This is what they look like with JavaScript turned off. Woo! <laughs> what the hell? It's because all of their content is in this enormous blob called a JSON, well, whatever, called JSON, JavaScript, JavaScript object notation. They're still writing all this to the page. Now, if you're writing this to the page anyway, 
Why not just display it on the page? Why do you have to do this? Why are you doing this to yourself? This is, you see the bald, some of that is because I'm like, Ugh! I don't get it. I don't get it. That explains why they do not rank for weather radar, or at least they're being outranked by such search engine giants as king5.com and accuweather.com. Now they have the text on their site, regional Doppler radar, there it is. Nope. Why is that? Well, here's accuweather.com without JavaScript. Google will tell you and Bing will tell you, oh, we can handle that. Yeah, they can handle it. It's still further from perfect. All right, all things being equal, it is still further from perfect. That is what they care about. They will rank you lower. If you show this in social media and they, all they see is random crap in the little link, they don't care if you're weather.com or you know, bigwind.com, breakingwind.com, whatever. <laughs> they're, they're not going to rank you as high. You are further from perfect. People will not click. They're not going to click. Now also, AccuWeather is crushed by weather.com in authority. They have much higher authority, many more links, better quality links, doesn't matter. Just don't use it to deliver content. You don't use JavaScript to deliver content. You use it to drive interactivity. This is not just about JavaScript, all right? This is about any screwed up thing that people do on their site for the sake of doing it. And there are many of them. Like um, I was just meeting with a client who's doing a one-page website, which is fine, but they're doing it that everything is a modal. So it's a little window that pops up, which is less than ideal for most users. They don't really enjoy having things pop up. And Google has actually recently said that in their upcoming algorithm updates, they're going to ding sites that have lots of modals. So if you go to a site like Forbes and that window pops up and everything else goes dark, Google's going to start smacking around sites that do that. Yeah, which, and, but users already do. So you can use HTML snapshots. You can use graceful degradation. There's all sorts of ways to try to mitigate this. But in the end, it's that versus that. All their things being equal. If these two sites are exactly equal, which one wins? And in fact, they're not equal, and this one still wins. They have less content, fewer links, less lower quality content, fewer users, less social media action, and less paid advertising. And they still beat them for, for rankings. Duplication. How many, how many people here have clients that, they're, that are, they were always trying to persuade to remove duplicate content? Right? And then they say, we're using rel equals canonical, which is fine, but all other things being equal, remove, will duplicate content move me closer to perfect? No. Okay? Repetition is not helpful on the internet. Whoops. Sorry. Um, you can use rel canonical, but again, all other things being equal. If you're using rel canonical, so Google still has to crawl all of those duplicate pages. If you're using rel canonical and people in social media are, ret are retweeting and posting 10 different URLs that should all have, that where all the likes should be aggregated to one URL but they're not, who wins? You or the site where that doesn't happen? Where there's one version, where Google doesn't have to crawl anything else. Where every single user who likes the page and reposts it is liking and reposting the same page. Who wins? They do. So what do you do now? Well, write this question down or post it on your monitor or something like that. Um, just always ask, all other things being equal, will this change tactic or strategy move me closer to perfect than my competitors? You can always go to the client and say, all other things being equal, will removing duplicate content move me closer to perfect than my competitors? Or you can just say, all other things being equal, removing duplicate content will move me closer to perfect. And then tell them about the breadth, depth, and difficulty. All right? And this is a pain in the ass. I mean, I, I'm not going to question it. You know, we tend to do things the hard way here at Portent. Um, but we do it because it's future proof. And because we're optimizing, by doing it, we're optimizing for all these algorithms because we're optimizing for ours. That's really the key. So our job, again, is to remember high distance from perfect in one part of the stack impacts the rest of the stack. That is the core thing we need to keep in mind. And your job is to always communicate risks and benefits of distance from perfect across the stack. That's what we're doing. And then if we're really lucky, we get to recommend and implement solutions. And that's it. I can ignore the URL. So, questions?
comments? I have a question. Mm -hmm. I suspect, and PPC is probably my weakest discipline, but I suspect that they are bidding on terrain. The word terrain, broad match. Yeah, so, well, but also they're bidding on a, fra on a single word, just terrain, whereas if they were bidding on terrain and vehicle, or if they were negative, they said a negative keyword, you know, negative D&D, &D, <laughs> um, that would, or negative wargaming, negative tabletop, whatever, then they wouldn't show up anymore. Um, Yeah, well, and that's why you would add other stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly the problem. And in fact, when clients come to us sometimes, and I quote them on our fee for managing PPC, they're like, "That's outrageous! You know, we can go over here and get it done for pennies." You definitely can. All right, you can use automated software that goes out and finds the highest click-through stuff, and just runs it. You can use automated software that does a better job than that, but it will miss things like that. All right, and less qualified PPC teams will miss things like this. So what I'm generally trying to do is explain to them, Andy just said, cheetah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, it was a long time ago, Ian. It was a long time, okay, all right. <laughs> Apparently, I'm sorry? You had a cheetah slide that came up. Yes, it did. I just wasn't sure, okay. Uh -oh. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you for giving me a moment there. That's good. That's good. Um, yeah, so PPC, you know, again, a lot of people will look at how much we charge and they'll say, oh, God, this is why we charge what we charge. And this is why generally when we get to do what we do, clients see success, right? Because we're not bullshitting around with duplicating content and cheesy link building and stuff like that. Blake? So Blake just asked if you increase distance from perfect in the bottom layers of the stack, like infrastructure, is the impact of the higher layers just sort of incremental? Is it geometric? Is it exponential? You know, what happens? Generally, things multiply pretty fast. I mean, if you have a slow site, then everything else, all your efforts in every other aspect of your marketing are going to be limited. So as an example, if your site takes 10 seconds to load, it's gonna be high, harder to boost your rankings in search because people are gonna pogo stick all over the place, people are less likely to link, and Google does look at site speed. We don't know how much of a factor it is, but it is a factor. It's gonna certainly hurt PPC, because no one's gonna buy anything. Um, it's gonna clobber you in social media because people eventually are gonna start just commenting on it. Um, there's all sorts of things that it, it impacts. You know, any work you do on improving the user experience besides speeding up the site, you know, it's, it's almost meaningless because people don't stick around. Um, you know, incorrect server responses, having your server say a page has moved instead of the page is gone. Um, again, not quite as big an impact because users don't notice it, but it certainly impacts SEO and paid search because, you know, all these bots coming to crawl your site get confused. Um, and then content, obviously, crappy content kills everything. Crappy analytics makes you reach the wrong conclusions across every single channel and about content. So you can see how that screws you up. Um, so yeah, and it goes sideways too. I mean, if, if you're doing something wrong and paid, it's gonna impact earned and owned, um, and it will start to percolate downward. So for example, if you buy, say, the word terrain, and suddenly you get 200 times the traffic to your site that you thought you would, that could crash your site. It could slow performance. It could get people complaining about you in social media. It can throw your analytics way the hell off. Um, there's actually a bunch of products out there that have various versions of BB and 8, but not with, you know, with, not with dashes or whatever, and they're all starting to show up in paid advertising for BB-8, you know, that's not so good. They probably should have read the headlines this morning. Other questions? Any general marketing questions, things you've run into with clients? Now, I know I, one option I put out there was stump the chump today. I am the chump, so if you want to fire away with anything, go for it. All right, cool. Well, have a great long weekend, everybody. Uh, and I will see you on Monday. Thanks.